Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this week's um, installment of Multicopter Warehouse webinar. This week, we're going to be talking about the DJI ZenMuse P1. And this is a, a, a drone and a payload package that I'm really excited about. DJI announced it originally back last, I think it was October, October. 15th or something at Energeo. It seems almost like a, a lifetime ago. But after the long announcement and long wait, it, we finally got our first um, demo model just about a week and a half ago, and right before the cold snap happened, so it slowed down our testing just a little bit. But John, my coworker, John Parker, and myself have had a chance to get out and do a number of um, PIX4D projects and DJI Terra projects with the new um, ZenMuse P1 and M300. And today we're going to go through some of those projects. We're going to talk more about the drone. So I hope everybody is excited to hear more about um, the ZenMuse P1 camera, I think it's going to be a real game changer as far as photogrammetry, payloads, and drones. And for you, you in the listening audience, if you have any questions as we're moving along, my coworker, um, John, he's helping monitor the, the questions as they come in. Please feel free to post your questions or let us know if you have anything that comes up as we're going through the presentation. And so with that, let's go ahead and kick off into our first slide. And I thought a good place to start would be kind of talking about the specs of the ZenMuse P1. And so if you happen to have your cell phone handy or other mobile device, you can take a picture of this QR code here on the screen, and it'll take you to the DJI website talking about the P1 specs. The specs I have laid out here on this slide are some of the key points that I thought I wanted to share with you. The first one is the operating temperature range. I'm sure many of you have experienced a cold snap over the last couple of weeks, and we did here in Denver. Um, my coworker and I tried to go out the day after we got the drone, and that day it was, I think, hovering at a brisk zero degrees here, and we had light snow. And on that particular instance, we were flying, and we got some avionics errors, and there was some light snow, and I think it was when we went up a couple hundred feet, we may have been lower than negative four. So we went ahead and we brought the drone back. But since that one instance, even on other days that have been cold here in Colorado, haven't had any problems whatsoever. So I believe that negative four is probably a, a, a temperature to be respected. And very much so. Also, my fingers, nose, and toes all said the same thing while we were out there. <laughs> Indeed. So the next thing I wanted to point out is that the, the P1 camera is a little bit different than what are the, some of the other cameras that DJI has created before. This one supports ultra-high-speed one rating SD cards. Most of the other previous DJI drones I've ever flown used a micro SD card, and this one uses a full-size SD card. And I'm happy to report that ours came with a 128 gigabyte card included with it. And so it's nice to have a good-sized card to start off with. You do certainly capture a lot of data with this full-frame camera. The photos that you get come out in a 3 by 2 aspect ratio with a pixel resolution of 8192 by 5460. And so going out and taking a sequence of photos that we'll be looking at here in a bit, we'll see that um, most of my image sizes came out to be roughly between seven and 20 some megabytes in size. So you can get a large amount of data relatively quickly with this drone. The file formats, same as before, you can get JPEG and JPEG plus DNG. And with the video, um, you can actually record video with the 35 millimeter lens on the P1 and you get an MP4 file with that. And then the other file or data points I have down here, the pixel size, focal length and principal point, those are all key values that you would enter into the PIX4D ground sampling distance or GSD calculator tool if you were wanting to try to leverage that tool to determine what your ground sampling would be at different altitudes. And so those values there are a great place to start. But I don't want to spend a whole lot of time about the, talking about the specs. I want to get talking more about the, the payload itself. When you do purchase the payload, it does come with the items shown. This is a graphic right out of the um, DJI material. You get the camera, of course, that comes with a camera lens. You get a nice, sturdy um, travel transport case for the P1, and then it also includes an additional cap or body cap, if you will, for the body of the camera and also for the back of the lens. If you take that 35 millimeter lens off and you to switch it with one of the other alternate lenses. And then, of course, you also get a, a nice lens cleaning cloth to help keep your lens clean so you have nice, crisp, sharp, clear images. And then what's not listed here is also you do, um, we got that 128 gigabyte um, my, or SD card. There are some optional lenses, lenses that will be available for the P1. It comes by default with the 35 millimeter lens. It's included with the P1. The 24 and 50 millimeter lenses are expected to be released shortly. However, as of just before this um, webinar, I checked 
and both the price and release date for these alternate lenses has not been released just yet. But in the long sh and short of it, if you will, having a 24... I don't think we're getting sound. Oh, we're not... Oh, not we'll begin shortly. Questions? Oh, currently only staff can participate in this. Yeah, you're not started yet. Oh, we're not started yet? Oh, here, are you seeing my slides? I see your slides, but it's saying, oh, like, uh, web webinar will begin shortly. Phone call. Start I'm on the phone call and we're on here. Here we go. Press dash one to start the broadcast for all attendees. And he's still on hold. Oh. Star one? I uh, star one. He should just be able to start. I heard him talking. the recording. We're on phone. To enable muting controls, press enter. Tom dialing in, talking, phone caller. The phone caller is talking. Hey, folks, I'm sorry you can't hear us here. I'm not normally technically illiterate, but I guess you can't hear what I say. I'm going to send a chat message to everyone. I'm really at a loss. I don't know what's going on. Unfortunately, without the start. No, that's the fix for oh, Okay. <laughs> that's another software. We'll bring this okay. over here. Um, audience sharing with audio. Yeah. What about on your computer, start one? No, because the computer's not hooked to anything. I'm... Welcome to the webinar. Hi, everybody. Welcome again to this week's episode of how to do a webinar without audio. No, I apologize for the technical snafu just a moment ago. I think we have the audio issues resolved now. So today we're going to talk about the Zenmuse P1 with the DJI M300. And it's a payload that I'm super excited about and have been waiting for some time. So let's go ahead and kick things off. So it wouldn't be right to start off with anything, I think, other than the basic specs. And these specs here are information you can get from the DJI website. If you use your cell phone and take an image of the QR code in the upper right-hand corner, it should take you directly to the DJI specs website. The specs I have laid out here on the table or on the screen are specs that I wanted to point out. The first element, of course, being the operating temperature range. I'm sure much of the country has experienced a cold snap lately, and here in Denver, Colorado, we're not really that much different. So the day after we received this drone, we we tried to go out flying, my coworker John and I, and we were in the parking lot. The temperature measured negative one, and it had a, a, just a super light dusting of snow happening. When we tried to fly the drone, we got up a couple hundred feet, and it had done a few passes already in flight lines, and we did get an avionics error at that point. We brought the drone back, decided to call it good for the day, and we've gone out several times since that instance where we've had temperatures down close to zero and um, certainly above, haven't run into an issue yet. So I do think that negative four operating temperature range is a good one to keep in mind if it gets that cold stay inside and do some data processing and go out and collect your data on a slightly warmer day. One of the things I'm excited to report is that this drone comes with a full-size SD card as opposed to the micro SD cards that many DJI drones have leveraged before for storage. And I was a little bit surprised, happily, to find that we had a 128 gigabyte SD card inside the camera when we opened it, and I believe that comes with all the cameras as well. I do want to talk about the photo size. You do get very large images with this full-frame camera. With a three by two aspect ratio, the image resolution size of 8192 by 5460 does come in just a small, um, just right at 45 megapixels essentially. And I found that on the first half a dozen projects I've done, in general, my image file sizes appear to be roughly seven to 20 megabytes in size, kind of depending on the content of the actual image itself. So you can get some quite a bit larger data sets, if you will, than what you may have previously gotten with the P4 or some other DJI drones. The images are being captured in that same JPEG format. There's an option for it to record both JPEG and DNG at the same time. 
But in my experience, the photogrammetry software, whether it be DJI Terra or Pix4D Mapper, et cetera, really just looking for those JPEG images. And so you can fill up your SD card a lot quicker if you're capturing both JPEG and DNG. I certainly encourage you to turn off the DNG and just go with straight JPEG. One interesting um, element I've learned about the M300 and P1 is it says here videos that do an MP4 format as I understand it, it only captures video properly with the 35 millimeter um, lens that comes with the camera. Using the 24 and 50 millimeter lenses, I believe may have an impact on the ability to record video. And then the last few specs I have down here as far as pixel size, focal length, and principal point, those are key values that you can use with the PIX4D ground sampling distance tool calculator to use that to help calculate your potential ground sampling distance at different altitudes. And also you can check to see when you're processing projects, the optimized values I have here to the side are what the software generated after running through and doing initial processing. So the optimized values came in very close to the initial values. When you get the, the unit in the box, you get the items shown here within the DJI manual that comes with the drone, you get, or with the payload, you get the camera itself that comes with a lens cap on it. You get a really nice travel hard case that will protect the camera and all the contents. And then you also get additional lens caps, if you will, or not really a lens cap, it's a body cap and a back lens cap in case you take that 35 millimeter lens off. That way you can keep it closed up and keep it clean for future use. And then of course you get a, a lens cleaning cloth. And what's not listed here in the box is, oh, it does mention up here at the top, including SD card and micro SD card. So actually there is an S micro SD card as well. And I'm still learning you're trying to figure out exactly what the uses are for that additional micro SD card that comes with the drone. And so the lenses that are available with this, it comes by default with the 35 millimeter lens and you can get an optional 24 or 50 millimeter lens the release date and the cost for these lenses have not been determined yet prior to the start of this webinar. I hope to have that information here shortly, but that 35 millimeter lens is really the optimal one, I think, for photogrammetry, and that comes included with it, so you're really good to go out of the box. The 24 millimeter lens would provide a shorter focal length or essentially a wider field of view, capturing a few less images perhaps, but at a slightly lower ground sampling distance. And if you transition to the 50 millimeter lens, you'd end up with a longer focal length, providing a more narrow field of view and ultimately provide a higher ground sampling distance result from a higher altitude, but ultimately requiring more images and longer processing time. One of the really great things about the P1 is that it's set up and in synchronized in such a way that it's capturing the images in a very efficient manner. It has a global mechanical shutter on all the lenses with shutter speeds between 1 8th and 1 2,000th of a second. And it's leveraging something called TimeSync 2.0 to allow it to essentially capture the, uh, the exposure time pulse in microseconds. So it gets a very accurate time of when the photo was taken and what the appropriate RTK GPS readings were for that point. And you get a very accurate recording for your point location. And then ultimately the exit pupil position at the center of the camera lens is recorded and as you can see from the graphic here, all three lenses, 24, 35, and 50 millimeter are all the same size. So regardless of what lens you're using, you get the proper exit pupil position when you get the, um, the GPS mark for that image. And then this graphic here just provides a few more in-depth lens option specifics. There's really nothing in here specific. I need to point out just some additional um, specs on lens options. You can find this information once again on the DJI website, so nothing specific or new here to share. And this screen here provides you like a screen capture, we'll call it, of what you see while you're working with or flying the M300 with the P1 payload. You get a lot of really good telemetry information to work with as you're flying along, certainly there in the middle of your screen, we'll call it, you get your live video feed. Then you also get all of your camera parameters up here at the drop down in this area here where it says ISO 100 shutter one, one over a thousand. You also get information on your focus mode here, autofocus or manual focus, what kind of mode you're in. The, um, with at point five here, you can get in with the camera gimbal menu and you can also adjust the gimbal slider here to adjust the, um, the, the altitude, if you will, or the angle. And then of course the recording mode, if you're recording either camera or video, manual focus slider here from infinity to up close. 
You can get a shooting button if you're shooting like either sh a shutter button to capture an image or start and stop recording a video, review your information, and of course then also change or get into your camera settings. One thing I have found is that if you fail to initiate or turn on RTK prior to an automated flight mission, you need to actually turn the motors off to start the RTK functionality. And so you do wanna be sure you have RTK turned on ahead of time for your mission to get the most accurate data. So just to put, for those of you who have yet to fly an M300, this, this smart controller, the enterprise smart controller is really it's something not to be overlooked. I think it's actually a great part of the system. And you can actually have multiple smart controllers hooked up to the, to the M300 at the same time in case you want to pass off the control to another another colleague or, or a co-worker. So, um, but it's it's really a sort of a step above and something not to forget about in terms of the overall quality of the system. Most sure, that's a great point, John, you're correct. That smart controller that comes with the M300 is really the, one of the, the best aspects of it that you get really good um, situational awareness and telemetry data. And then here's just a quick overview of the controls that come with the um, with the drone, sort of the smart controller here, just a, a vector drawing of it. You get the same kind of capabilities here, left dial, the, the left dial button allows you to adjust the gimbal tilt up and down. The record button on the right allows you to um, start and stop recording or take shutter buttons, et cetera, and adjust the gimbal. But really during an automated flight, you don't need to use any of these controls. You just need to monitor the video feed and monitor for surrounding air traffic, et cetera. It's really a pretty hands-off process. And then it wouldn't be right, I don't think, to talk about the M300 without talking about what one of the elements that comes with it that doesn't get mentioned all the time, and that's Enterprise Shield Basic. The M300 and P1 are both considered enterprise level of hardware. And so by default, they come with Enterprise Shield Basic, which is somewhat analogous to what I'll call the consumer version of DJI Care. And so with the Basic Shield, you have the ability to um, get up to two replacements um, in, a, in the first year. Those replacements do come at a low prorated price. And ultimately you can then renew that beyond the first year if you've not used those two replacements. There's also an option called DGI Care Enterprise Plus. And we've had a couple of customers contact us saying they'd like to get that, but they've done that after the fact of ordering um, the M300. When you order the M300, you get it as either an Enterprise Basic or Enterprise Plus. And the Plus package for a few dollars more allows for really an unlimited number of replacements. And also there's um, no fee for those replacements, if you will, throughout the year. And if you happen to be using one of the Zenmuse XT cameras, they'll actually provide you a backup service. If something happens to that XT camera, they'll send you out another one while they're repairing yours. So very, very handy functionality there to help keep you up and operating continuously. Yes, sir. So there's a, we had a question about mm -hmm. if the camera can be mounted on a dual gimbal. Great question. And I haven't tried that yet. My understanding is that it will only work on the the what we'll call it the um, position one on the dual if there if it were to work on the dual gimbal it will only work on the first position and because of the smart oblique mode which i have a video example to show you the camera moves around quite a bit during um, a flight and i think having a second payload over to the side adjacent to it would likely interfere with the, the smart gimbal aspect so i don't believe it's really intended to be work used with a dual gimbal payload but that's a good question yeah and along those lines we've got a question someone's asking if we can put it on the uh the m210 rtk um i think technically it might fit but it will not work it's not compatible with the m210 i and you may be able to actually hook it up to the, the bottom of it but it, it's unfortunately only supported by the m300 and then also the last item I wanted to talk about, the last um, slide I talked a little bit about something called DGI she, um, Enterprise Shield Basic and Plus. They also offer a maintenance program for their drone. And some of the basic maintenance recommendations are, they do suggest that perhaps every 200 hours or six months of frequent use, that you have the drone serviced with just periodic maintenance, update and calibrate, et cetera. But it is a good idea to kind of stay on top of your service of this drone just to keep it in top op operating condition. 
And then they, this right here provides a little bit more breakdown of exactly what is provided with both the basic, standard, and premium services. And if customers are interested in getting a DGI maintenance package, please reach out to John and I, and we can provide pricing information and more details on what's really covered on the different maintenance programs. And I don't want to get bogged down in this too much because I want to get to the data, the good stuff. And so right now, the only flight planning application that exists for the M300 and the P1 is the DGI pilot app that comes built into the smart controller with the M300. And this, um, this DGI um, pilot app is really a great app that's really taking into consideration all the different functionality of the drone and all of the um, different sensors there and really provides a good information feed point, if you will, to, to the pilot as he's working. And so when you're doing a mapping mission or a pre-planned mission with DGI Pilot, you have four primary options. You can create a waypoint mission that allows you to essentially set waypoints or do a live mission record. You can do a mapping mission, oblique or linear. With the M300 and the P1, the mapping mission is really what you wanna choose. There's an option under mapping to choose smart oblique. When I first got into it, I thought they might have the smart oblique functionality baked into the oblique settings, but it's actually under the mapping settings themselves. So if a person were to choose the waypoint mission option within the pilot app, you have the option of setting individual waypoints or setting waypoints for a flight path. And then you individually have to go through and define what drone actions or camera actions would happen at each waypoint. And so this can be a somewhat tedious way to kind of create a mission or at least a mapping mission. And I wouldn't really suggest trying to do a waypoints type set. Having said that, they do have the option to do a live mission recording function. And that's, if you choose that, when you um, start that option, the drone remembers or records all the different geographic waypoints that it goes to and stops at throughout its mission. And then you as a user can essentially record that mission and then repeat it again in the future. And so that might come in very handy for an inspection type mission or something that requires more of a hands-on manual flight around an obstacle as opposed to a simple grid type mapping mission. So we've got a, a mission question here. Oh, sure. It's, uh, someone is asking, is it possible to use the Ground Station Pro app with the M300? Not at this time because Ground Station Pro, I'm afraid, is only available on the um, iOS format for the iPad. For the, yeah, on an iPad. And right now, the M300, you can hook up an Android, like Crystal Sky type tablet to the remote control for an auxiliary outside monitor, but it's not compatible with other iOS devices or any iOS device, I shouldn't say other. So, yeah, unfortunately, Ground Station Pro is not the application you'd want to use and in the long run ground station pro doesn't have the functionality for that smart oblique function or data capture and i think that's really a big part of the special sauce of the m300 and the p1 that smart oblique we're gonna get that into that a bit more And then so for a mapping mission, that's where you'll find your smart oblique option. And so if you go in, you simply choose the option, select mapping mission. And when that pops up, you have the option then to go through and select what camera and lens combination you're using. So they list there in the drop down list, you can choose P1 and then it'll show you 24, 35 or 50. Go ahead and select the 35. And then the other default options come, that come up within the software is I was a little bit surprised that the gimbal pitch started off as what they called a negative 45 angle. And in our initial couple of test flights we did here at the office, we did seem to get a couple of what I'll call leg shots doing a negative 45 degree angle. And so in my later flights, I adjusted that back down to, well, I changed it to what we'll call 60 degrees or I brought it down 15 degrees, I guess. And that seemed to resolve the issue, wasn't getting the leg in it any longer. The default ground sampling distance with the P1, given the default flight height of 100 meters, which would be right about 300 or so feet, and using the 35 millimeter lens, the software reports that you'll get at a GSD of roughly 1.26, and I didn't specify there, I just said GSD 1.26, that's centimeters. So you get a really nice fine GSD, even at 300 meters or 300 feet or 100 meters up. And then you have options to set your altitude modes with relation to relative to takeoff point or ASL. I went with the above takeoff point or altitude. And then the flight um, rough altitude, you have the option of choosing between 12 and 1500 meters. 
So you can't really choose to do a flight lower than 12 meters with the M300 and the P1, unfortunately. But yeah, I don't, I'm not sure what instance where a person would be flying up at 1500 meters, that's a little higher than what we do here in the US. Yeah, I have a question for us. Yeah, so we got a question. Does the flight planning have terrain following capability? Um, yes, it does have terrain um, following capability built into it. Um, I haven't tried to test that functionality of it just yet, but it's my understanding it leverages the sensors on the drone to maintain the altitude above the, the surface, more so than a pre-configured um, DSM, but I'll need to do some more testing on that. And if you send us an email, we'll definitely follow up with the, the complete answer after we do some more testing. And one thing that I did find that was a little bit surprising as far as um, the speed of the drone, the takeoff speed, you can variably set that between one and 15 meters per second. But for the horizontal speed, I found that using the smart oblique mode due to the complexity of the way the camera is moving and capturing images, if you choose smart oblique, you don't get to pick the flight speed going forward, if you will, that's set by the software. If you choose just a standard Nader mapping mission, you can set the mapping speed or the flight speed for a mapping mission. But in Smart Oblique, the, the software defaults and it has a what we'll call a variable speed. It kind of slow, flies faster when it's just capturing a few images. And then when it starts capturing both left, right, et cetera, it slows down a bit. And then there's options under both advanced and payload settings where you can adjust the amount of overlap or course angle they, give, they use the term margin, and that uh, refers to how much in excess of your dis defined mapping area that it kind of covers to give you extra coverage around the edges. And then you can also, under payload settings, uh, adjust the focus mode. But it's set up fairly slickly that the drone will actually fly to the first waypoint, direct the camera down, and will do an autofocus there before the first photo capture, and then just maintain that throughout. And so when we go into the smart oblique mode here, I'm going to start this little video capture off to the side. In this instance, we were able to hook up a 360 camera to the side of the M300 as it was flying. And you can monitor here as it's going along how the camera adjusts and moves about as it's capturing the smart oblique. And so in the video here, you may notice that the drone's capturing forward, sideways, then nader, then forward, sideways, nader. It's not really doing back or right. And that's because on the first couple of lines of the mapping mission, it doesn't necessarily capture all the different directions. It's, it's smart enough, if you will, to orient the camera in the proper direction of where your area of interest is and only capture those images that focus on your project area, thus reducing the amount of images you'll have in the long run and speeding up your processing time. Yeah, and this is a good example of what Aaron was talking about a minute ago in the, the variable flight speed of the, of the drone. Depending if it's just catching a few obliques on an outside flight, it goes faster. But if it has to get all four or five shots near one spot, it goes really slow. Well, not really slow. Oh, about two, about two meters. It goes, yeah. yeah, it varies from about two meters per second at its slowest yeah. up to as high as about 14, almost 15 meters per second yeah. when it's in more of the transitional areas. And so here in the video, the drone's kind of coming to the end of its flight line. It's turning around uh, here. Can you turn the sound off the video? No, I don't think I can. <laughs> or wait, maybe I can't. Is that? Stop the video. Uh, there we go. I can't turn the sound off. I'm sorry if that was annoying, folks. <laughs> I didn't think about that. And so, yeah, this just kind of gives an example of how the smart oblique functionality works as it moves along. And I found it to be really slick and it captured a lot of images. And as it's going there in the middle part of the mo model, it just going snap, snap, snap. So let's go down here to the, the next screen. So this here provides an overview kind of map, if you will, that was our first project that, or not our first, but one of the projects we're gonna be discussing today. And that's the Smart Oblique Capture for Pirate's Cove Water Park. Who wouldn't wanna visit a water park on a day like today? So you can see here all these little white dots scattered across the screen would be the individual photo locations that were captured. In this instance, the drone ended up capturing a total of 1,065 images over about a 30 minute flight time. I flew at an altitude of 377 feet above ground level for um, my flight, and I went with the default overlap of 80% front and 75% side overlap. And when the drone landed, I ended up with about 15 gigabytes of data among those 1,065 images. The overall ground sampling distance came out to be 1.49 centimeters or just, uh, just a shag over a half inch, 0.59 of an inch. 
And overall, the, drone, um, the quality report reported that we covered roughly 47 acres. And so I'm unfortunately right now, I don't have a similar data set to share showing what maybe a Phantom 4 mission would be covering the same area. But you can see here from the flight lines, the drone flies back and forth in a standard, what I'll call a single grid format. It takes very dense imagery here over the main mapping area. But as you get off to the right, left, or above or below kind of peripheral area, you can see that the photo capture rate is much smaller. And most all, uh, really all those images there are what we'll call the oblique data capture, either to the side or kind of focusing in on our mapping area. And then all the nadir images are interspersed there in the middle. So you get a nice, good defense, thick data load and really good overlap amongst all of your images. And so without further ado, let's go ahead and take a look at a project. And so the data I have up here on my screen right now, if you use a mobile device like a cell phone or a tablet or something like that, you can click on this QR code, or not click, you can take a photo of this QR code up here and it'll take you to our Pix4D cloud website that has this project. Or also you can just move your mouse over and click the link here that says the share token, and that should take you also to that. And then we'll have this link up for a while. This bottom link here at the bottom that says HTTPS, Drive, Google, et cetera, that link there will take you to a Google Share Drive where I have all 1,065 of these images. It is about 15 gigabytes of data, so be sure you have a, a good data connection to pull that down. But you can go out and pull, get all these images and data that I captured here of the Pirates Cove, Shark, or Pirates Cove um, water park and you can run some processing yourself. This little fly through video here is just kind of giving you an example of the results I got from, this is showing you Pix4D um, mapper, but I also got really stunning and exceptional results out of DJI Terra. I just wasn't able to kind of share things out of Terra quite as slickly yet. I'm still learning the Terra software and have used my Pix4D software for a number of years and more familiar with that. So we'll leave these items up here on the screen for just a moment to give people a chance to pull up these data sets. And while that's there here, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pull over the version I have for desktop mapping or my desktop cloud or desktop. So this is the exact the project I have here in Pix4D Mapper that I've already clipped out. You may notice some green markers across my screen. And these are some elements that I wanted to kind of go back and visit with you here during our presentation. So if we start off here, the first thing I want to show is a sky ruler. The sky ruler, if we focus on that, we'll just zoom down in here. This is a device that we here at Multicopter Warehouse sell. And this is an item that is a corrugated. It's normally black and orange. The one here you can see has white squares at each end. I covered those with reflective metal tape to use as a emissivity target, if you will, for a thermal project and left in that way. But this is a, a target that should be five feet long. And we can see here from my initial measurement that I did in PIX4D, just placing a point at each end here in the, the point cloud, I got a measurement of 4.93 feet, so just seven hundredths of a feet off of the expected measurement. And so that could just be the, the specific pixel, really, that I chose here to accommodate that measurement. And so I believe we got a measurement right on, if you will. I also have another spot here, if we zoom over to that, you may see that here in the parking lot area, I put down a 25 foot tape measure that if we look here at one of my individual photos, you can see the quality and the clarity of an individual frame from the P1. If we zoom in down here now to the, the what we'll call like the pixel level, you can see this small yellow stripe going across the edge of the parking lot. And that was a, a standard Milwaukee 25 foot, or it was a 35 foot tape measure that I only strung out 25 feet of. And doing a measurement on that, I came back at 24.91. And so also a very good, I looks a little bit farther off there, 0.9 hundredths of a, a foot, but not too bad. Yes, oh, you have a question? Elevation? Um, the, the elevation of this? Of this mission? The, ele fly, uh, fly I've, the, uh, the altitude at which I flew here, if we come back and go back one slide, we'll see I flew at 377 feet roughly. I, I put in, a, I believe it was, um, 115 meters. I tried to be about five meters below what the maximum altitude was there, just to give myself a small buffer so I wasn't at the full 400 feet. But that's a very good question. Thank you. There we go. Okay, so going back into the, the project here, 
we got really good detail, I thought, around all of the, the building, and especially I was excited about the quality of the detail back here on the high tension power line that was running through the back of the project. The point cloud reconstructed the lattice of that high tension power line really well. The triangle mesh that was generated out of PIX4D didn't do quite as good a job there in the um, the high tension power line, if you will, kind of disappeared out of the mesh. I can go back and try to tinker with those settings a bit more, but ultimately the point cloud is more accurate than the mesh anyway, and you want to do most of your measurements there in the point cloud. And I was really happy with the quality of the point cloud here as far as, if I come back here, you can see that we got a good bit of the power line that came out in it all the way around, even down here towards the other power pole. Both of those came in really nicely and just got, I thought, pretty stunning detail down here, like the, the little footbridge that goes across the river. You can see a lot of detail actually in the river itself as far as, um, well, like the, here in the point cloud, it's not quite as clear. If I switch over to our mosaic editor to see the actual output ortho mosaic, I'm going to take just a moment to load this up here. Sorry. Well, this one's taking a little bit longer than I'd anticipated to load. So while that's doing, while we're waiting for PIX4D to load up there, let's go ahead and bring in DGI Terra. Are you a question? No, go ahead. So this right here is a, the exact same project in the same data set, if you will, that I project processed with DGI Terra. And when I processed the work with DGI Terra, I also got very good measurements as I was just showing you. We can see here on my 25 foot tape measure, for this instance, this point right here, my measurement here came out to be 24.97. So the processing in Terra, I don't want to say it came out better, but I, it came out a, a little bit more accurate on my, my measurement right here. And if we go and we check out the oh, back by the um, power line sum, we can come back over here. It just so happened that somebody else, a real surveyor, which I am not, happened to have come through here recently and did a number of right-of-way markings for the power line. And I was really happy to see that we got enough detail and clarity in the 3D model. If I zoom in here, you can see pretty clearly this little red blob in the middle of the grass here. The um, surveyors had gone out and spray painted a spot on the ground, marked a point, and also put in a about a three foot wooden lath. And they marked a number of right of way easement, or the right of way easement around this power pole. And all of them had what we'll say is a 75 foot marking. And I was really excited to find my right-of-way marking here came out at, or actually, let's find which right-of-way marking that one was. Oop, no, no. Or, okay, I think it was this right-of-way mark. Let's zoom out here just a little bit. Okay, so yeah, this all my right-of-way markings came out very close. I had 75.03, 75.1, 75.07. This one right here came out, let's see which one that one is. This one came out a little bit more off of 75.39. And I think that might be because the point was coming, one of the points was back here kind of almost behind a tree. And that may have affected my measurement there just a little bit. But once again, I can zoom in here. And in the, in the ortho mosaic, you're able to make out the point where that stake was in the ground. And it works very smoothly to get um, very accurate measurements all around there. And see here if my PIX4D has been able to load up it. Nope. Looks like it's still loading cameras. I'm sorry, I should have had that preloaded. It was poor planning on my part. Let's go ahead back into Terra here for just a moment then. But I was super impressed with the quality of the reconstruction in Terra. As far as we zoom in here, this is the actual pi pirate logo on top of the, the water dump station here. And while this water bucket, if you will, didn't reconstruct quite fully, we did get a bit of the graphics here on the side where you can make out where it says Pirate's Cove there on the water dump bucket. And just really kind of stunning quality detail in the 3D mesh. You can see the little um, boat here above the, above the um, gazebo or the water slide stand here. They had a, a roof boat on the top. And you can even make out good detail in the... Um, um, sunshade canopies, if you will. And so just good overall stunning detail all the way around that I thought was super impressive. I have not had a time yet to go through and get my GPS data differentially corrected. I did put out some ground control points here 
and you can see how easy and clear it is to see the particular ground control point to mark the center point of that. So I believe you can get very good accurate measurements from putting out ground control. I just put out a couple that I'll use as checkpoints ultimately. There's ground control point two, and we scroll back out here a little bit, we can zoom down here and see we have then a third ground control point I kind of put over here a checkpoint. And then once again, I apologize, I haven't had a chance to check further on that checkpoint, if you will, to see how actual quality of the data came out accuracy wise, but I have a very good feeling that it should be very much spot on. And we can see here just good reconstruction all the way around. Is the other project still loading? We got some questions. We could address. Oh yes, yeah, so if you have some questions, let's address those while we have some. Yeah, perfect. What yeah, questions so we yeah, have? Uh, yeah, and thanks for all the questions, folks. Uh, so one of the questions was, is it compatible with Esri Site Scan? So Esri Site Scan is using Pix40 algorithm. Oops. And so, yes, it will be able to, site scan will be able to process these images, but you wouldn't use the site scan for um, creating mission planning or things like that. But yes, I'm, these images should be able to be processed within site scan without any issue. Okay. Uh, another question was, uh, just to be clear, so we use the pilot app to plan the mission, but we use Pix4D and actually also Terra to process the mission. And that's absolutely, yes, we can, you can do that. Yeah, I'm typically I'm Pix4D, and I don't mean this to be about Pix4D, this is about the P1, but Pix4D is hardware agnostic. The Pix4D capture application does not currently support the M300, and I'm not sure what timeline they have for it supporting it. It may not because of the smart oblique mode. That's an extra level of complexity that they may not be able or willing to program in. But the DJI pilot app that comes with the drone is spot on geared exactly for photogrammetry mapping it does a great job of mission planning and does excellent work and there's no extra cost associated with that then from there i did pro i did not use dgi terra to fly the drone i believe i can hook up my computer to the controller and fly outside and do what we'll call 2d live mapping but because of the poor temperatures we've had lately i wasn't really trying to drag my computer and a bunch of other stuff outside for the mapping mission we'll do that on a subsequent mission but I believe you can also use the DJI um, Terra for, for flight planning, or you will be here shortly with the next release. Okay, and then a follow-up to that would be, is uh, UGCS compatible? Um, and so it does work on the M300, but does it, the question is, does it work with the planning a smart oblique mission? I don't have a solid answer on that for you just yet. I haven't tried to run a mission with UGCS. We did though successfully install the UGCS software on the M300 smart remote controller. So that's something we'll have to, I'll make a note here of to do some testing with UGCS. I'm hopeful it will work, but I know for certain it works with DJI Pilot. Okay, another interesting question is, does the smart oblique increase the accuracy of a DSM in vegetation? I guess if there's more openings, then it can see more ground. Um, well, in this case here, um, let's see here, is, we're, is that still loading up? See if I kick back out to the ray cloud here. Let's real quick do, um, let's see here, if I click on animation trajectory. There we go. So let's just go through and play this video again here that I, I recorded and we showed earlier. If I play this back here, we can see, let's see, that must be, This does not seem to be the same animation trajectory I was expecting. <laughs> Let's try that one more time. Uh, I think because it's trying to do something else, my computer's loading. My, yeah, I think it's trying to do two things at once here. It's not able to. So, so along the same lines here, someone is asking about. Um, how it would do in a Christmas tree field versus, you know, trying to determine quantity and heights. Um, quantity and heights, I believe it would do, I would also say excellent quality work there. Let's turn off this. What I'm wanting to get in and show you here is the level of detail that we got around the trees. And if I turn on the um, class colors, we can see here that the class colors, it did a good job with the um, classification. So if I come in and I turn off 
high veg and go turn off the class colors, we can see here kind of how what it saw as high veg and then the holes that were still kind of created underneath that vegetation. And certainly, I mean, we did this with, during a period of time a year where there was leaf off, we had some snow on the ground, but we still got what I would call, consider pretty good um, penetration, if you will, kind of around and through and by the vegetation and got a lot of detail for the ground, but certainly more open terrain is more helpful, if you will. In this case here, if we turn the um, veg back on, back in this area here, kind of back under these trees, we can see that it's still got very good ground penetration here, kind of under these thicker trees. And I believe you'd still get good vegetation or good information for ground, even at less than optimal settings. So I, and I, I don't believe it'll work quite as well as the LIDAR unit L1 that's coming out, but I was really impressed with the level of detail back up under trees, et cetera, with the, the mesh here. And so I think our mosaic editor's edit, yeah, our mosaic editor is loaded up here now. And so here within the mosaic, what I was wanting to show you earlier is the level of detail here in the stream below the bridge. I happened to take a walk across this bridge while I was down there setting up my ground control points, et cetera. And you could actually see a number of these little divots or kind of hollow spots here that were fish breeding holes, if you will, or fish nests down in the creek that you can kind of make out here in the imagery. And if we bring up and we show you the digital surface model that I got here, certainly you don't get very great digital surface model data for down in the water, but got good data for really everywhere else, I think, across the, the project here. And you can make out the picnic table that was in that area right there, the train tracks going through this area here in the middle. We kind of come down this way, the other bridge kind of going across and the fortification to riprap kind of blocks that they have here at the bottom of the bridge area. The rocks that really pop out, not so much in the ortho mosaic, but when you turn on the DSM, you can see those rocks much more clearly. It really represents those. And then, of course, as we come back up here, really good crisp details. You can even see, like right here, this is an example with the digital surface model. That as we zoom in just a little bit more, you can see that this is actually where they had some palm trees that had been taken down and were laying across to the um concrete abutment there in the area but even that level of detail came out as far as like the dsm the trees there so really what i thought was good quality details all the way around and the nice thing was that overall this flight took only about 30 minutes and here in denver colorado we are at a slightly higher altitude so our flight times we don't quite get the, the full 55 minutes that dgi advertises but when i set the drone down after this mission here i i believe i still had I hadn't gotten a low battery warning yet, so I was still probably about 35% battery. I could have pushed even further, if you will. I wasn't trying to see how long of a mission I could do. I was just trying to test to see kind of what the initial results were out of the, the software. And let's see here. If we come back in here to, to Terra for just a moment, I wanted to kind of, well, this was the first example here that I, I did with the water park. Oops. And the quality of the mesh that came out of the water park here, especially with the, the slides and whatnot, I was really impressed with. But the day before, a coworker and I, we also had a chance to come back out here. I did one other project. And in this case here, I believe we go to the oblique, we can go to the aggregate. And so this is a project that we flew at right at the full maximum. I was at 120 um, meters or right at 400 feet here. And so we can see similar kind of pattern where you get really dense data here in the center, a little bit lighter around the edges. And this is just the 2D map in DGI Terra. But this was a aggregate work facility where they were doing um, a bunch of separation of different rock materials, et cetera. And I, there's nothing specific here about this ortho mosaic, but the 3D map I thought came out really nice as well. We load that up here. And so this is right along the South Platte River here in Denver, Colorado. And you can really make out great details here of the um, flood abatement issues that they put in or sort of the water flow hydro hydraulic features around to control water flow here in the river. And then when we come over, really good sharp details on all the componentry around the aggregate plant itself as far as all the ramps and the conveyor belts and machinery all have just stunning, I thought, detail where you can see the actual individual rocks here on the conveyor belt going up and doing size comparison, if you will, here. 
but very nice quality data that once again went very quickly and we can see here in this particular model this is the 3d mesh and so here the 3d mesh or actually yeah the model if we turn on the point cloud data take it just a few moments to load here we can see in this data set in the point cloud that the software was actually able to get the power line data very well i thought kind of above here if we kind of come down it didn't get every last little bit of power line, but you've got enough of it there that you can certainly, I think, connect those bits together and understand the amount of sag that you have in the power line. And the 3D mesh, or I'm sorry, the, the point cloud for the um, towers came in very well also. Unfortunately, they didn't seem to quite reconstruct in the, the 3D mesh, but that's okay. You got some more questions, sir? Yeah, so, the, yes. The, uh, uh, one of our participants says, so the DGI website advertises that you can you can do 700 acres in a single flight with a P1. Um, let's see here, the, the specific stats I saw, if we kind of come back out here, I have, let's see here, a link on this next page. The folks at DGI, they, they had a an article talk, talking about the top seven features of the P1, and they advertised down here in smart oblique, oops, in smart oblique mode 0.5, Smart Oblique Capture for smart operations, you can get up to 7.5 square kilometers in a day at three centimeters GSD. And so, yeah, I need to do a little bit more testing and tinkering to, I don't want to say to confirm that value, but I, in the ground sampling distance I got currently with these projects was at about, a, um, about half of that ground sampling distance of 400 feet. And so I think that may be with a 24 megapixel camera, or not 24 megapixels, 24, 24 millimeter yeah. lens, providing you a slightly wider field of view. And then I think that would affect the um, GSD as well. So I'll need to do a little bit more testing with that. But certainly I, and the mission I, I did there in 30 minutes would have been at least two or three flights, I believe, with a Phantom 4. And I'll do my best to get out and repeat that mission again here shortly with the Phantom 4 RTK. That way we can share sort of side by side data sets. Just some days there's not enough time in the day to do all the data sets collections you'd like to do. Good segue question about the Phantom 4 uh -huh. versus the uh, M300 with the P1 using the same overlaps. Mm -hmm. And I would say that doesn't change, right? Yeah, I pretty much try to stick with that 80, 75, pretty much all my missions. Yeah, regardless of camera. Yeah. But and the difference with the P4 is because that's only a 20 megapixel camera with a one inch sensor size that even flying down at 200 feet, you won't get as good a detail and resolution. I, I'm certainly happy to go out and repeat this mission and <clears throat> and capture more data with that drone. I just didn't have enough time that particular day to get that done. But you would have to fly at least a double grid and i don't believe i could have planned a mission to cover the same footprint if you will with um with the p4 here in a single flight okay and another uh another question is uh asking can you use oblique photos in a photogrammetry mission and the answer is of course absolutely. yes i capturing the oblique photos really help make the 3D reconstruction more robust. If ultimately your end goal is to create a very sharp, crisp 2D orthomosaic, a top-down view of the world, capturing the oblique data isn't really what we'll say necessary. You could just do a standard 2D mapping mission with a nadir orientation and a single grid, fly the area much more, much more quickly, and get just about a good, as good a data, but you won't essentially get data for like the sides of the buildings, and things like that, but certainly as far as the lay of the land and contours, et cetera, that data would come out the same. Okay. Um, any more information about the uh, TimeSync 2.0? Well, and the information I have on the TimeSync 2.0 is that, as it mentions here, it's being able to work at what we'll call instead of the millisecond, this is at a microsecond. So they have a very accurate timing system built in that is synchronizing the measurements from the two arms that have the GPS antennas out. I believe the they're in the, the back, the ones with the more of the Keurig cup kind of antenna. Those are the GPS antennas. And it's synchronizing the time that it's record, making its recordings with the time of the, on the flight log with the controller. So you get the moment that the shutter happens, it's syncing and recording that 
that point location for the exit point of the pupil of the camera. And so I'll have to do more research on the TimeSync 2.0, but that's what I know about it currently. And then I'll go ahead and I'll go back to this slide here with the links in case you I can't click on that screen or it goes away. <laughs> well, with some links that allow you to see, once again, if you want to go visit the data site that I have up on Pix4D Cloud, or if you want to follow this link here at the bottom of the screen, that will take you to a Google Drive where you can download all of the imagery that was captured here. There are two folders that will be downloaded because once you get to 999 images, DGI rolls over and starts writing data into a second folder. And so there's 999 in the first folder and about 64 or 65 images in the second folder. And so it, overall, it's about 15 gigabytes in data size. Some people are saying they're having trouble clicking on the links and making them work. Oh, dear. Uh, we'll have these up on the, huh. on the recording. Yes, that, that link there seems to work. I certainly do apologize. So maybe it's just a good webinar issue. Could just be a go to webinar issue. I believe once we get this posted up, it should work or that that's why I spelled the links out there also in case the QR code doesn't work. But I believe if you just come up and click on the QR code, that should take you to the, the link just as well. And so, yeah, I was avoiding trying to be out on the page at the same time but on the cloud page just because I didn't want to have multiple people hitting it and kind of causing distractions there. But I encourage folks, take time, please download that data set. If you're interested in seeing the aggregate data set that I have collected, send either John or myself an email and we can um, make that data shareable as well to you. We're happy to share out our sample data sets and help address any kind of questions you might have. Um, if you have a chance, I would encourage folks to look at DGI Terra for processing. It's not that PIX4D is bad or anything like that. I'm just really impressed with how well DGI Terra processed this. I still need to do some more looking at the quality of the ortho mosaic. If we come back here and look at Terra again. This oh, we've gotten back into this other project, but and this one here you can see just really good quality detail in the digital surface model here for for the area. And just overall good quality results even out of software I'm not familiar with just yet. If we switch back up here I want to go back to that other one really quickly here. Go to a 2D map. And I did notice that you'll see some gray striping in here, some coloration issue. The day that we were fly that I was flying this mission, when I first was out there, I had really nice sunny conditions. And about five minutes into my flight, all of a sudden the wind picked up and I had some clouds blow in. And that's why we had sort of the significant change in lighting conditions here that at first I had good sun and then the sun got covered up for the rest of the time and I didn't have very good sun anymore. But yeah, I'm just, I'm very happy with the, the quality of the outputs here. And so I go ahead and we can put this last slide back up here. If anybody has questions about the M300 or the P1 payload, or you want to see some additional sample data sets maybe we weren't able to share with you here today, I'm ha um, both John and I are happy to follow up with folks. Please feel free to email either of us, A. Woods or J. Parker at multicopterwarehouse.com and we can share um, data sets with you or also firsthand experiences of working with this equipment. But I'm really impressed with the P1 and excited to get one for myself. Okay, one, another question here just came in. Mm -hmm. Does Terra have timeline like Pix4D? So Pix4D's timeline functionality is really only on the cloud if you pay for what's called cloud advanced. And so right now, from my limited understanding, I've only been playing with DGI Terra for a couple of weeks now, and I've used D Pix4D for over almost seven years. But in my initial experience, it seems as if all the processing of Terra is done on the desktop, and there's not it's not really set up in such a way that you have a timeline. But if we come back in here and we look at Terra a little bit, we can see here along the top portion of the graph, you have an option up here for 2D maps for 2D multi-spectral map, if you're using like a P4M, or then also 3D model. So this particular model of PC or Pirate Cove 2D Terra, I went ahead and I processed it first as just a 2D pro processor output, and that's where you get your ortho mosaic file here. Then I went back and I ran it also as a 3D project. And if we go into that mode then here, it'll load up the point cloud pretty quickly. Turn off the camera. 
I wish all the 2D map was a 3D model. There we go. And so you can sort of skip back and forth between different views there. And then if I come over here to my left, once again, I could have different projects here. It wouldn't really be a timeline, but I could go from one to the next, like under my 3D models here. I have the aggregate data that we can go to the 3D model here. And then I also have the ability here to show different projects. So I, I wasn't really prepared today to do an in-depth review of PIX40 or DJI Terra, but it does seem like a very capable and um, good quality program that produ produces excellent quality ortho mosaics, um, ortho tiffs, or, and um, 3D models. But I'm still experimenting a little bit with the way you share the content from DJI Terra and how you do additional work with it later. Any other questions? Does it for us? No. Well, once again, I really appreciate everybody taking time out of your day. Please feel free to reach out to us here at Multicopter Warehouse. You can give us a call at 303-552-2300 or email either A. Woods or J. Parker at multicopterwarehouse.com. But before we completely sign off, next week we have another webinar coming up, I believe, John. Do you know what the topic for that is? Yeah, it's good. We're going to look at the differences, the fundamental differences between photogrammetry and LIDAR. So it's basically... Uh, a primer for to sort of go over the basic fundamental technologies of each, just so everyone has a good understanding of what each can do and what are the advantages and disadvantages relative to each other. Oh, super. And did I hear earlier that you might have um, Harrison Knowles of Rock Robotic joining you? Well, he's going to help out and uh, probably not be on the webinar, but okay. going to, uh, they're going to help supply us with some data sets where they did photogrammetry and LiDAR at the same site. Oh, wonderful. So it'll be really good. Well, I'm looking forward to that and we'll be sure to hope everybody can tune in next week. Please, if you have questions between now and then, reach out to us. We're always happy to talk drones here at Multicopter Warehouse. Have a great day, everybody. Cheers.